And I was talking about how um, that you uh, will name somebody after your deeds. And I'm thinking the whole time somebody will, he'll probably be naming somebody brings back the shields at some point. That's just my, that was kind of stuck in my head. I know, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know who this would be, but maybe, I don't know. I'm just thinking that. Um, so I've met a few folks in the room, but um, if you don't know me, my name is Dean Nikolai. I'm the department chair for Native American Studies. Of course, I got Aaron as one of our faculty there, and he teaches primarily in tribal historic preservation. So historic preservation is really passionate for both Aaron and I, and we pretty much... We just, uh, we teach all the core curriculum for that program. And it's one of the only, pro well, it is the only program like it in the United States. Um, so we're pretty proud of that. And man, I just, I tell you what, I love having Aaron there. Uh, he dazzles crowds. And uh, um, I don't know where he stores that information, but it's all up in there somewhere. I, I, I'm not as good as that, so I have to put it up here, right? So, um, so um, one of the things that I know, we. We, Jen and I talked about um, the College of Forestry and some of the things that we're doing that are sort of similar or might be of interest to people, students and faculty at the College of Forestry here. So one of the things um, I've been interested in since um, I started working in preservation was, was culturally modified trees or anything that was related to culture and trees. And one of the things I talk about is I talk about them as living artifacts. Right? And you can see how Aaron was talking about these shields as, as artifacts, but they carry life, right? And that's part of the philosophy that we have as native peoples. So one of the things I always kind of throw out for audiences when I talk to them is some, some terminology, right? And so I often, talk about, I often talk about indigenous methods or methodology and how we do things. Um, so a big part of what we do in our program is methodology. So we don't just treat child, tribal historic preservation, we teach it from an indigenous perspective, right? So that's pretty important for us. Um, so I always kind of toss, toss this out as well, is I'm sure everybody's heard of indigenous methodology, but if you were to define what that is, could you come up with a definition off the top of your head? 10 words, what is indigenous methodology? You just pointed at me and I was shocked. <laughs> I love that because when I see a student, I do the same thing. I'm like, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing is because I ask that and people have a really tough time defining what that is, right? And so um, if you, there's a lot of definitions out there of what indigenous methodologies are, right? And they're particular to different kinds of things that are going on. So if it's tribal historic preservation, yeah, we have our own point of view and our own idea of what that means, right? Um, but that's also embedded into the things that we're doing out there. So if it's curation work, museums, if it's field work, if it's in the classroom, uh, we talk about the philosophy and our belief systems all the time. That's big for us. So one of the things I, I did um, as a grad student, um, I had an opportunity to go to Norway and do a master's program in indigenous philosophy, which was right up my alley. And um, one of the things I wanted to do was talk about trees, of course, right? Because that's kind of, a, kind of my thing. So um, I always throw up this picture because I want folks to take a look at it and go, wow, what is that? It always brings up a lot of questions. And when I do presentations, what I love to do is get an audience engaged. So feel free to ask questions, have a conversation. Um, that's kind of like the way I like to do things. Um, so one of the things I do, like I said, I put up this picture and I say, what are, you, what are you looking at here? What is this? Well, you can see a bunch of names here, right? Um, you can see a year, 1921, and you see all these folks standing at this place, right? So part of our indigenous philosophy and how that's bedded into, um, into our methodology is through some other kind of terminology we throw out there. So things like place names, oral tradition, right? Is anybody familiar with place name projects and what those are, right? So things that happen at a place often is there's something associated with it. So it might be something that happened there or it could be a person's name. It can be a lot of different things. So if you drive up through the reservation just north right here on Flood Reservation now, you see all the signs as you're on your way up. And if you're going north, they're in Salish. And if you're coming back, they're in Kootenai. Right? All those are place names, right? And so that's part of the place name project there. 
Um, and so that's a big deal for us because that tells us about our culture, what was happening at different, at different places throughout time. And you can see Aaron was talking about this constantly, right? Who are these people? What are they doing? How they associate with these objects? Well, for, for me, trees are just as important. Um, like I said, they're living artifacts and that's embedded in our philosophy. So this picture here is, um, there's actually some pretty important people in this picture. This gentleman in particular, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him, um, but that's one of our um, chiefs, Chief Martin Charlo. Um, he actually left the Bitterroot, right? Uh, and brought the people up north to the reservation. Um, but this was taken in 1921, so back in the Bitterroot Valley, there's a lot of things that are really important to tribes, tribal peoples there. So um, I have some different affiliation in my tribal background. Uh, I mostly identify with Salish because I grew up here. Um, I do have some Sioux in my background, but I don't know much about that. So, uh, but I love to talk about family um, and connection and a connection to places. So if you see here, you can see the different individuals standing here. And it says, Be beside the ram's horn tree. Um, it has also a lot of other names. Um, it's also known as the ram's head medicine tree. Um, has anybody ever been down there? Has anybody ever heard of this ram's head medicine tree? So there's different types of trees that we sort of cut, fall in this umbrella of cultural modified trees. Uh, some are medicine trees, some are have more practical use, uh, but they're, um, for tribes, they're all cultural, right? But to me, this one's really fun to talk about because it's affiliated with story, with place, um, with time and with individuals, right? And so um, I'm going to come back to this in a minute because I want to explain some of the things that are going on there, but I'm going to back up for a second. And it'll probably get more apparent as we get, get closer to this. So let me back this up a hair here. Um, I'm just going to fill this up for a second because it's the abstract that I used um, for my master's project in Norway. Um, I actually did spend a lot of time here on campus too. I was here for 10 years plus. I did an undergrad in anthropology, Native American studies, and a graduate program in anthropology here as well. Um, my, anthrop my anthropology project here was more archaeological. They ask you to do certain things that we're not always happy to do as grad students. Um, and so uh, my idea of research, just for myself, is more qualitative. Um, of course, if you're going to be an archaeologist, what do they want, Kyle? Statistics, numbers right? Do those kinds of things. I like to avoid that stuff as much as possible, right? Um, so, so one of the things you can see up here is I'm talking about uh, cultural resource management and frameworks and what are those. And so oftentimes that's pitted against tribal peoples because tribal peoples aren't really a westernized, I, uh, their philosophies aren't uh, embedded in western ideology, right? And so what do I mean by that? We think a lot different, right? We think a lot about the world as, in, as, as, as really different things, right? So um, let me just jump here to the next slide here because I wanna show you a picture. Um, so one of the things is uh, that we see places as ongoing and, and, and affiliated with who we are. So this picture is a picture of my uncle and my son. My son was four years old. And this is actually at the Ram's Head Medicine Tree. Um, so every year, the tribes go down there, and they sort of, uh, it's, I wouldn't say like a pilgrimage, but they go down there for renewal, and they talk about the place and make sure that it's still affiliated with the people, and that people understand what that place means. Um, so to me, this is a pretty cool picture because it's, it's about us still doing the things that we've always done. Um, of course, we're not, uh, uh, we weren't wearing tie-dye shirts, you know, 100 years ago, um, but we're still going down there, right? So I was talking about the difference between Western and non-Western ideas. Um, so one of the things I did, wanted to sort of frame when I did the project there was how we see the world as different things um, and how that translate in, translates into protection, right? And so for a tribal historic preservation, that's a big deal for us. Um, and so you can see I just kind of dichotomized some different things here. Um, what's an indigenous method compared to a scientific method, right? So I know we have some folks here that are actually teaching here at the university and doing bigger things, right? 
okay, administering, <laughs> right? And so, so this right over here probably looks really familiar to you, right? I mean, we all understand kind of, I mean, if you go to any kind of institution, even here, you're going to understand what the scientific method is, right? But how is that different from an indigenous methodology? Are we so interested in this huge background of Western theory? Maybe not. Maybe we are. What's the difference between being objective, subjective in um, anthropology. I always ask students, is it possible to be totally objective? I don't think it is. I really don't. But we read lots of theory on why we should be objective, right? For tribal peoples, I feel like it's almost impossible to do that. Because why? We're associated with the things that we're dealing with, right? So they are part of us. It's almost like it, it, it is us, right? So we're very subjective about those things. Um, being theoretical versus uh, traditional knowledge and worldview. And when I, th when I say worldview and traditional knowledge, I'm thinking about things like inanimate versus animate. So Aaron was talking about these shields and how those are associated with people, and he, he still talks about them as being present today. Culture-modified trees are no different. We look at those as living artifacts, right? They've been touched by somebody else. In our philosophy, they still have meaning. Um, but to a forester, what do you think they're going to think about? They think, it, think about a tree as living, and how does that translate into treatment? of those things. We see we cut our forests down all the time, right? We've had to lobby and, 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 and be activists for the medicine tree and the bitterroot for a long period of time, no problem. Um, and that's because we look at that thing as living, right? And that tree actually today is not living in the Western sense, it's a dead tree. It's down there, the top's missing out of it. Bark's falling off it, but it's still there, right? So it's for us, it's very animate. And it's not just animate. It has this holistic feeling with it, right? Because that tree is not just there um, as a piece of living history. There's all kinds of things that are attached to that. So people weren't just there for the, for the tree. They were camping there. They were going by that place often. They were leaving things for success. They were doing a lot of different things there, right? I don't want to get into frameworks in travel, historic, uh, sorry, in historic preservation. That's the boredom of historic preservation, but it's something we deal with constantly. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about um, in my thesis was how do we come to some middle ground where both sides can sort of communicate and figure out how we're going to protect things, right? And so what I say is the, the laws that were written for in, in um, cultural resource management weren't necessarily written for tribes. We are included, but our philosophies aren't. Almost are nil. There's just nothing there as far as philosophy goes, right? I'm going to jump by this very quickly. So what are some of the things that we include in historic preservation? Well, Kelly was here a minute ago and she was talking about, she's got a couple folks right downtown right now looking at the historic district because they're having some disturbance down there because they're putting in a brewery, right? So under the laws and practices, it says that anything that might be affected um, and might be eligible for the national register has to have a survey and we need to take that into account. Right, so when I put this up, I always ask students, because I use this quite a bit for students, I say, well, what are these things, right? We got the Navajo Bridge. Has anybody been to the Navajo Bridge, right? So you cross that Navajo Bridge, I mean, it's a historic site. It's in a national register. You might have a federal building downtown like we do. It's got a national register plaque right on it, right downtown. San Francisco trolley, right? And then you have this over here, and it's just a pile of rocks, right? Well, there's a lot of people out there attached meaning to these things, right? So if you are from San Francisco or you know about the history of San Francisco, you want to protect those things, right? If it's uh, downtown Missoula 
and it's a historic district, people have attachment to those places and they want to protect it. Navajo Bridge is no different. But I always put this one up here and it has association as well. And so under our laws and practices, we use different criteria to, for nomination of those places. And so I always ask students, what is it that you're looking at there? And I have them guess. So what do you, th what do you think that you were looking at there? Has anybody heard of a Karen before? What is a Karen often associated with, maybe? Or can it, what can it be associated with? Finding your way. Finding your way? So it could be a trail system, right? It might be an event. It could be a burial site. It could be all kinds of different things going on there. You see Karens on the top of mountains right now, everywhere, as people go up the top, and they put them right next to ones that tribal peoples built hundreds of years ago, right? I know we've been doing some work up in Glacier, and we actually talked with Kyle, because he works up there, about going up and seeing some of these places, and you're monitoring these, right? Is that right, Kyle? Yeah. And people are going to these places, and they're adding to these things, right? What does that do to that place? I mean, it's no longer the same kind. You know, the context starts to disappear. They might take things apart and rebuild it over here or over there. And so for tribal peoples, we go, oh, well, ouch. You know, that's our history. That's our past, right? And so they might not see that the way we see it because our philosophies are often different, right? So this one here is actually associated with a battle and a burial site. And so it's not very tangible because you look at that place and you go, well, I don't really see anything there but a pile of rocks where you can look at the Navajo Bridge and wow, you can see that, it's right there in the open, right? Or you can see the downtown district in, in San Francisco or a federal building, it's right there in front of you. But for tribal peoples, a lot of times, like I said, the laws aren't really written for us, so when we try to protect things, we have a really tough time doing that, right? Because it's not so tangible. So there's a piece of criteria there that actually works for us. Um, and, uh, and I'll get to that in a second. But I want to talk about some trees and some different types of trees out there, okay? Um, so uh, I was talking about the medicine tree as one. We'll get to that here in a second. But there's some other ones out there. Um, so I did a collaborative project. I'm always talking about collaboration because I think it's a really good thing, especially for our tribal college, right? And hopefully others as well. Uh, but I did a collaboration project with uh, an archaeologist from Norway. Um, and he was also interested in culturally modified trees. And we started talking about the similarities and the differences of what the things we were looking at and our philosophies. And we, we found so many similarities, more similarities than differences as far as uh, the use of trees. And so if you are in the forestry program, you're probably going to be able to identify that tree pretty easily, right? What, what kind of tree is that? Yeah, Western Red Cedar. Are there a lot of those around here? Not really. I mean, there was at certain times in history, but they're here, right? And they're often in certain places, right? So our tribes actually here use them for a practical use, um, often for cedar bark baskets, right? And so those are used for different activities, to go collect things, to, for storage, and things like that. And actually, this summer, we recorded a few up in, right next to McDonald Lake Lodge. Um, they were a little bit confusing because they didn't fit the, 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 um, the typical uh, basket cut. And so we're not sure exactly what those are, but there's ways of going about that. And I'm going to get that to that in a second because that's part of the methodology that we use. Sometimes we'll go survey before we do other things. But for tribal peoples, part of the methodology that we use is to talk to people. Aaron talked about, he interviews folks all the time. So Aaron, I know Aaron has said this lots of times that um, he's more of a cultural anthropologist than he is an archeologist. And you can see that in him, right? Because he's out there talking to people. So in the Western way of doing archeology, span often people aren't even included in that, right? So tribes aren't asked about what's going on. Um, archeologists go out there and they just record. And they're following the laws and practices because that's what they say. And so the consultation between tribes is often neglected and not even talked about. So uh, for me, I do understand the history of these types of trees. Um, I did the, the research and the background and the ethnography. So I knew when I got out there, if I saw a particular tree that had something going on with it, I could identify what that is, right? This one here is from Norway, though. 
And so when I saw that one, the, the gentleman's name was Sven Donald. He said, he goes, what do you think that is? And I'm looking at it. I mean, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's very similar to our ponderosa pine, but also kind of like a lodgepole as well. And so I'm looking at him. I just, I threw out a bunch of stuff, but I really did. I wasn't even close, right? So the indigenous population of Norway are who, do you know? The Sami, right? What, what traditionally do the Sami people do? They were herders, right? They were reindeer herders. They first hunted reindeer. Then they took them and started doing other things with them, right? So once you start to gather your herds, some of the things you're probably going to need are going to be out there in your landscape, right? And so he started to sort of fill my brain with that. And so I was looking at it again. I said, well, okay, I think I know what that is, right? So if you think about this, you're looking at it. What do you think that might be? Uh, probably about anywhere from about here to here, I guess. Four to six feet, four to six feet or so. I mean, it just looks like stobbers coming out of a, a tree, right? But it doesn't look typical because they're not the actual limbs. They're actually being placed in that tree. And it's a very practical use. What would you say, Kyle? I was thinking like with maple syrup, they, they... All right, that, so that would be something like back east, right? But here they, what do you need to do with your reindeer sometimes? Hitch them. Hitch them, right? You need to tie them up. And I was like, oh, geez, seems so simple, right? So everywhere, they're everywhere out there. These little hitching posts are all over the place, right? So they would hitch their reindeer up to these trees, tie them up and things like that. And I was like, wow, pretty cool, right? So this one, you got a basket cut and you have this one very practical use. This is also a cedar basket cut. Um, this one's on the reservation up north. Um, and one of, the thing, one of the reasons I took this picture is because I wanted to talk about destruction, right? So oftentimes when people don't understand something, they destroy it, right? And so we see this, in, I was talking about Karens, right? They're up on top of mountains, tearing them apart, building new ones. They have no idea what those are. So the philosophy behind that is that if this is living for us, what do you think this means for tribal people? And there's probably tribal people actually doing some of this stuff even, right? Is that something we want to see? Not really, right? And so oftentimes there's that disconnect, right? And so the Western versus non-Western, our belief systems, very different. So, um, so under our laws and practices, if um, the integrity is lost at a site, it's no longer eligible for the National Register. But for tribal peoples, the meaning is also lost, right? Like the tree has been hurt, right? So the animate part of that tree is kind of lost, right? And so here's another one here. Now this one's in Norway. What kind of destruction do you see what's, is going on with this one? Yeah, people are shooting it, right? So Norway, what they would do is the Sami reindeer herders are out there for months at a time doing what they do, right? Herding their reindeer. And they would actually carve faces into the, to the old deadwood pieces on the side of the tree. And those actually have a lot of meaning. And the people there actually have the memories of who did these activities, right? Uh, their laws and practices are different than ours, but still destruction, right? And for them, they don't like those kinds of things. And often, there's a real disconnect between um, the indigenous population and others in Norway. And they see Sami people as in the way of progress. And so if they can destroy something and sort of just wipe it off the map, then they can go in there and do whatever they want, right? So people are in there destroying all kinds of different things. Um, when I talked to Sven about this, and he showed me this picture, we started talking about destruction. He, he was disturbed about it. You can see it in his body and his face when he talked about it, how he was just disgusted and sad by it, you know, saddened by it. And, you know, a piece of history is then lost, right? And so that's a pretty big deal for them. Here's another... Uh, similarity between 
culture, Norway, and here. Um, of course, we got a big ponderosa pine here, and uh, they're similar tree in Norway. Um, this one is actually a cambium peel. And so tribal peoples use cambium um, as, a, as a food source. And so um, right now in Glacier National Park, the SKC and Glacier have a collaborative project to uh, survey the Ponderosa Pine cambium peeled trees on the North Fork of uh, the Flat River. It's a third year project. We just started our third year basically of the project. So we've been out there surveying these trees, mapping them, and part of that project is to uh, do the survey to map them, uh, the nomination process for the National Register, and then suggestions for management out there. So for me, that's a pretty big deal because that's collaboration. Um, and our views are now, in some ways, they're going, oh, wow, you guys have a program that's pretty interesting. Why can't you guys come up here, help us out with this project, tell us a little bit about what you know that we don't understand, and let's embed that into the philosophy and the management of that area, right? So some of the things they're worried about in that area is fire. And so they can mitigate by doing some of the things, but not destroying those trees, right? So what does fire do to a ponderosa pine? Will it, all, will it always kill it? No, it'll survive it, right? And so we have, th there are some dead ponderosas up there with fire scars in them. There's some live ones with fire scars in them. Um, there's live cheese that haven't been affected by fire. Even if they were, some of them we couldn't even tell anyways without coring them and doing certain things like that. Um, so in Norway, they did the same thing. They were pulling cambium from trees. They are feeding it to their reindeer. We actually, uh, if you go on the low, low trail over the top, which is a Salish trail and a, and a Ned Spears trail, not a Lewis and Clark trail, <laughs> right? But it is as such, and it's nominated as such because of these important people. Um, but if you go up there along the top of the trail, you're gonna see cambium peels 10 feet off the ground, right? And so when you look at that, if you don't understand the history of peoples and why they were in there or what's going on, you're gonna ask yourself, well, why is there a peel way, way high off the ground like that? And why would you think? Isn't it only a starvation spill? No. Ah, that's a good question. So, Yeah, so if they're going through there in the wintertime, you have snowpack, trail's still there, you're still going through there, but you're peeling way off the ground, right? And what were you gonna say? Snow. Oh, yeah, exactly, snow, right? Um, and, and actually, we, we, we've been talking about this as far as the Glacier Project quite a bit because um, one of the things we were looking at as far as the nomination process is association. So who are those people, who are those trees associated with? Is it the Kootenai folks? who have a ten, long tenure in that area? Is it Blackfeet? Is it Salish? Is it Shoshone? Is it some interior, more interior tribes? Um, so part of our method is to do what do you think there? We need to get out and actually talk to those people and figure out who was there. So we have some ideas of what was going on there. And there is some good ethnography out there that talks about time frames and when people were in the park. And so one of the things we did is we actually cored a couple of those trees. Um, and we were actually pretty reluctant in doing that. And why do you think that is? Because these are living artifacts, right? Tribes aren't so willing to allow archeologists to go out there and start poking and prodding things and putting things into trees and pulling them out, right? So what I did is I talked to our culture committee and I said, I said, what do you think? And so I did this with the project when I was doing cedar basket trees, and they said, it's fine as long as you're not damaging the trees. And so what we did is we did some cores on a few trees just to get an idea of when those trees were harvested for cambium. And we kind of um, did some rough counts of the tree rings while we were there. And what we found is they correlated to a starvation event with the Blackfeet. Um, we're not positive, but if we're talking about a nomination process and we want to bulk up that, that nomination, we can then say, well, look, you know, people were here at this time. It's associated with this with event, an important event in our history. And we would write that into that nomination process, which is pretty interesting. Um, 
for tribes, they're not always so interested in doing that because their idea of preservation is, is often leave it alone. Don't touch it. Just don't even mess with it, right? And so, um, so getting tribes involved, I was actually talking to a couple of folks that are Kootenai Culture Committee who have some really good background ethnography on that area, and they are not willing to give it up. They don't even want it involved in the project. They don't want it being published. <laughs> you know, so does that make it tough for tribes then to preserve places? If we're following the laws and practices in, written in this Western world, and we're trying to do the things that we're required to do, but tribes are still reluctant in following those ways, we're at a disadvantage, right? So we talk about this in tribal historic preservation at our college as and sort of like an inhibitor in some ways, but um, we still want to do it our own way if we can, right? And so we try to figure out how to do those kinds of things. Here's another picture. This is a trail um, blaze tree up the Jocko. Um, so is anybody familiar with Arley Valley? We'll see ya. So if you go into Arley and you go over the Jocko all the way to Sealy, that was a trail corridor to get to that area to go hunting. And so if you follow the Jocko Trail, um, you're gonna see that there's a lot of old Ponderosa along that trail, and they have these old blazes, just like the Forest Service does, right? So where did the Forest Service get their idea of blazing trees for trails? Native peoples, right? <laughs> so I was on the trail crew here uh, for Lolo when I was um, in between my junior and senior year. I'm up there knocking blazes out of these trees, and the guys tell me, oh yeah, we need to have them like every, and I was like, well, there's already one in there. He's like, well, just redo it. And here, I might have been blazing an old tree with a native blaze in it and just redoing that thing over and over again. But I don't even think that the people, and I didn't even understand at the time, um, what that blaze meant, what it was doing to the tree, how old the original one might have been, those types of things. So something like this, since it's on the reservation, tribes aren't really in a hurry to allow people to know what these are or even advertise them. And so preservation for tribes in some ways, just leave it alone. Don't advertise. Don't even let it be known to the general public. In some ways, it's the best way of preserving something, right? And so we can't do that in Glacier, by the way, right? It makes it difficult for us. Um, so here's a picture of a Sami man blazing or uh, pulling uh, bark off a tree to get to the cambium. He's using an old-fashioned metal tool. And then here's one over the top in the Sealy Swan. That's my, um, my grandmother's sister, Agnes Vandenberg, um, uh, blazing a lodgepole or cutting uh, ca uh, ca cambium from a lodgepole. Right? You can also see there's some cut trees here. This is an old black and white one here, but uh, there's some cut trees around this area too. Right? So just another similarity in culture. So philosophies across indigenous boundaries are often similar. Um, I don't like to stereotype when it comes to philosophy because tribes have their own idea of philosophy when it comes to preservation. Um, but you do find a lot of similarity and it's actually kind of fun to talk about that. Here's a picture of, what did you call it, Aaron? Dendroglyph? Dendroglyph, yeah. Um, of a reindeer in, uh, on a tree in Norway. So, like these guys were out there, they weren't just doing things haphazardly, they were leaving um, their presence on landscape, right? And so, um, it's pretty interesting. What's that? That's bighorn, right? And so, I'll, I'll expand on this here in a second. So the ram's head medicine tree um, down the Bitterroot has been known, for, known to tribes here for a long period of time. There's all kinds of stories associated with that tree. Uh, the tree is embedded in our oral tradition. Um, it's talked about in the context of time memorial, um, dating back to origin stories. Um, and individuals and all kinds of different things. Um, they're the story that's attached to it, um, for us in our philosophy, we, we don't tell that story unless there's snow on the ground. 
Um, but it is related to, um, there are published versions out there. Um, and if you wanted to read my thesis, there's a, I have a version in there. Um, but I can give you sort of an idea of what the background is there. Um, that um, coyote is a big part of our oral tradition. And so in order for um, two-leggeds or humans to uh, live on the landscape, coyote did a lot of different things to make that happen. And one of those was associated with this ram's head medicine tree. So there's a story about coyote making it safe for passage in that area, right? So as a traditional area for the Bitterroot Salish, as one band of the Salish, um, people often would leave things at the medicine tree for safe passage um, or for success, right? And so it actually was uh, a huge campsite as well in that area. And often when they would go over the trail towards the big hole to hunt, they would leave things at the medicine tree for, to garner success, right? And so the story of the ram's head medicine tree is direct, directly associated with that practice. And so one of the things we talk about when we talk about nomination for the National Register is association. A lot of times we're challenged when it comes to that. So you can see when Aaron was talking about shields, how he could talk about the association, who that individual was, when it was, what they were doing, how validating that might be, right? Because others go, well, it's just a shield. It's sitting in a museum, but we don't know the backstory. We just bought it. There's no provenience with it. And so for us, we have oral tradition that talks about that place and what it means. And so I have a good friend, um, uh, that she's like, I have a couple pictures for you, you gotta see these. And I was like, well, what are they? And so she gave me this picture and she's like, where's that at? And I said, I have no idea. And then she gave me this picture. <laughs> and it's the ram's head medicine tree with the ram right behind it. <laughs> and so part of that, um, uh, part of the story of the tree is how the ram um, and coyote fought for this place. And there was actually a ram's head embedded in the top of this tree for a long period of time. When the tree finally died and the top fell out, the ram's head went with it, right? So it was actually grew around this. The tree was dated at over 350 years, um, sometime in, the, I think, the 60s or 70s. Um, and so when we talk about association, I mean, there it is. It's right there. It's visual. Right? So the people that actually talked about this place as a story, well, there's things there that were always there, right? So rams, whatever might be there. So sometimes um, when we talk about oral tradition, um, it's very spiritual, but it's also practical, right? Because people uh, live in landscapes for long periods of time, and their stories become part of what that landscape meaning is, right? So we actually put meaning into landscapes by coming up with stories, right? And then the treatment of a place sometimes is better than that as well, right? So there's actually a story of Nez Pierce, um, folks coming over, camping with the Bitter Salish band, and then going over to hunt in the big hole. And the story goes that one of the Nez Pierce men shot the tree with his rifle. And everybody warned him that like, wow, that's not a pretty big, that's a pretty big deal. And um, that's gonna bring you some pretty bad luck. When they got to the big hole um, and got over east of the mountains to hunt bison, he was um, charged by a bison bull, knocked off his horse and killed. <laughs> and so that for them was validation of treatment, right? And spirituality. And so, so people leaving things for success was very important to them, right? And so it's really cool when you see something like that for tribes that really validates that place and the meaning of that place. So I said we would get back to this. So in this picture, there's a lot of individuals here. I know Aaron talked a lot about family and importance of family and how they're associated with things. For me, this is very important because this, a lot of these folks in this picture are my family. So you can see here from, I'll just kind of come over here. You have your, your individuals. You have Adele Vandenberg, Harriet Whitworth, Sack Woman, and others. Chief Martin Shallow, Victor Vandenberg, and others. This is my grandmother, my great-grandmother, 
my great great grandmother and so for me when i see a picture like that and because i know the history of that place it's a it's a pretty big validation because those people have been associated with that place for a long period of time and they've been going back there right and continuing that spirituality and that presence there <clears throat> There's a lot of stories of Sack Woman. She was very well known. Um, she, uh, there were stories um, associated with Sack Woman, and that's kind of how she gets her name, that um, elders would talk about Sack Woman to their children to make them behave, right? So if you're doing certain things, well, Sack Woman might show up. And <laughs> you don't want that, right? And so. But look how distinguished she is. Would you want to make her mad? I don't think so. <laughs> My grandma was very kind of, I don't know, like the word stoic, but she was very like that way as well. I always say like, I never wanted to make my grandmother mad. <laughs> so they used to want to go there, right? So <clears throat> I'm just going to throw this up for a second. Um, so one of the things that, it, uh, start, that came out of this nomination project for um, the Ram's Head Medicine Tree was that um, they actually uh, went through the process through the National Preservation, Historic Preservation Act, consulted constantly with the tribes here, looked at the ethnographic history of that place, included it into the nomination process, and then actually protected it, um, nominated it in the National Register, and then transferred the property back to the tribes, which is a very big successful story for tribes because we don't often see those types of things happening. We were talking about repay, somebody asked, uh, what's her name from the library? I can't remember her first name. Uh -huh. Yeah, she was talking about repatriation. What falls under repatriation? It's the, the, the definitions of repatriation are very vague. Um, and so for tribal peoples, I think they think it was repatriation of anything out there should be repatriated to tribes, including property, right, and land, and things like that. Um, so to me, this was a success story, and the, one of the things that sort of made it a success story was this idea of landscape. So is that something that anybody's familiar with? Tribal landscapes, and what that means for tribes? What I say about meaning of property, how people are living in landscapes for long periods of time, and they give meaning to that landscape, right? And so you, you can see it in this picture. People are there, there's a tree, there's a ram, right? So over long periods of time, that became a place for tribal peoples. So all that was actually included into the net registration um, process and was actually, in, in, in most part, made possible by uh, an amendment to the National Historic Preservation, which is Bulletin 38, which considers tribal, traditional cultural properties as a piece of the nomination process. So tribes were actually able to put their input in, talk about that place, give it more meaning, and then, and then use it for the nomination process. So um, Aaron and I both talk about landscapes as part of the methodology that we use for um, preservation. And so if we're talking about um, methodologies for um, indigenous peoples, could you define it now? What would be some finer points of an indigenous methodology? I'd say it's, it has to stem from the indigenous community. Yep. For one thing. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do is we, I can't believe this just came off here. How do I get it right back up? How'd you do that, Aaron? Yeah, talk nice to it. Oh, man. <laughs> what are you, why would you do Oh, that? I was just going to put, put that back up. Just press that button right there. Oh, there it is. There you go. Look at that. He's the pro. <clears throat> That's why he pays me the big bucks. <laughs> so... Part of the method is to um, look at the ethnographic um, history and include that as early on as possible, right? So one of the differences between the Western way of doing things sometimes is that it's not always included right away. 
oftentimes um, there might be a database somewhere that talks about, hey, there's certain things here and there. And so we should go make sure that monitor those places when, a pro places when a project might be happening. But for tribal peoples, it's different because the meaning of those places is often more important to us, right? Um, what else do you think might be included in that methodology? Right, and the way we go about that cultural preservation, right? So invasive versus non-invasive methods, right? So if I was to do some dendro work, um, I wanna make sure that uh, elder committees or preservation office, everybody's okay with that, right? And so that's a pretty big deal for us too. So we don't just go out there and do things on our own. We wanna get a consensus from the tribal peoples as far as what they wanna do. Um, and there's all kinds of examples of that. Our tribe has a no dig policy and it's based in our philosophy um, that we don't want to disturb anything because those places have meaning. Whether it's a rock, a uh, projectile point, a tree, um, or even a place where something happened, right? There might not be anything tangible on the ground, but people might, might have been camping there at some point and didn't leave any mark on the landscape, right? Um, Oral tradition is a huge part of the method, so we want to understand our stories, how they're interconnected and interrelated. Um, and so that is part of the methodology that we use. How's that different from a Western scientific method? Well, it's almost polar opposites, if you think about it, right? And so, well, that's about all I have for you guys. I don't know if you have any deep questions or comments or whatever, so. How many years, Dean, did you say the Glacier Park project is? Uh, it's a three-year project. Three year, and mm -hmm. you did your third? We're, we just year? did our third year. Uh, well, we, we didn't survey our first year. Okay. We surveyed our second and third year. And so we took it as an opportunity to, uh, um, for field school for our students. Sure. It actually wasn't designed as a field school. But the flexibility of, of the partnership working with Glacier has turned into a field school in some ways, right? So we're able to take our students out there, talk about what's going on there, show them the methods of actually recording these trees because there is, there is crossover. I mean, we're using data um, because in some ways we're bound by data um, when we're doing um, certain things to protect, for, to protect resources. Um, but then, like I said, the most important thing for us is that, that um, collaboration process. And so Kyle and some others were actually able to come out with us and do some of the work. And uh, we had a lot of fun out there, I tell you what. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and so we're, we're actually hoping at some point, maybe some of our students might be field techs up there in Glacier. And so. Um, I think that's, I'm, I'm, I can see that that's where the direction's probably heading at some point here. Um, there's a lot of space for other projects for our tribes and other tribes in the state of Montana in association with Glacier National Park. Um, so places like Flat National Forest, Bitter National Forest, Lolo, BLM, DNRC, Highway, there's space for all of us. Um, but we just feel like we should be included in a lot of those different things and we not, we, we're not always included in those kinds of projects. Um, oftentimes, this is the story I always talk about is that when you work at a preservation office, these entities are re required to consult with tribes, right? And oftentimes what you get is a letter and it shows up in the mail and that letter gets thrown in a, in a file drawer somewhere and tribes are so much at a disadvantage because they're understaffed, shortage of people, often their education is lacking in the area of cultural resource management. So um, others will take advantage of that in other entities to keep their projects moving forward. Uh, I have a student, um, we have a, a former student that's working in uh, Olympic National Park over in Washington, is that was it? Olympic National Park? Um, she said that they sent her and one of their other techs to Portland for a CRM Section 106 training. And it was her 
and a bunch of older white fellas and non-Indians, non right? <laughs> Section one about consultation. And she said the whole, the whole training was how to avoid tribes and keep your projects moving forward. And I said, whoa, what? what's going on here? What is that about, right? And so oftentimes um, in cultural resource management, your jobs aren't really about preservation. It's about projects, right? And keeping those going. Um, I know in forestry that probably some of the same types of things are happening. Same time you have, like fire is a big part of this now, um, where you do get tribal consultation before and after fire, um, but it can be pretty minimal, right? And you may not even have people on the ground that understand the history of those areas, so they're, they don't know what they're looking at, right? And things like that. What were you gonna say? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Aaron, Aaron could kind of chime in here. And I'm glad, I love having discussion about this. I know when Aaron was working for the BLM, right? Before even call, yes. right, what did they have you do? The first come, day. The, they wanted you to come up with a manual for a consultation with tribes? That was day two, yeah. For yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they walk into my office, I have an associate's degree, and they asked me to write consultation policies for tribes for all seven reservations in Montana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did that include? Day three was pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we actually have a student right now that was asked to do this for the National Bison Range. So this is a, I'm gonna here. <laughs> mm -hmm. this is a thing that happens all the time to tribal people. We get hired as interns to be interns. And we get there and we, get, we become the spokesman for all native people. And then <laughs> we become the experts on all things tribal. And Dean's talking about one of our students who is there for an internship experience. And she's asked to write a training manual on traditional ecological knowledge. And it's like, she just, there, this happens all the time. This happened to me. It's like, guys, pace yourself. These are students. Treat them as such, you know? I'm getting mad at all of you right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> Brown don't really know anything. Mm. Yeah, but she called and she was so she confused. Was she was so confused. She's like, what are, what are they really asking me to do? I was like, well, it sounds like they're asking you to write policy. And I'm like, whew, that's a pretty big deal, man. You know, and so. Denver to present on it, it's like, that's a lot to ask for an undergraduate student. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that policy, they could either use it or not use it. And some of the things they were asking her to do, she felt were crossing ethical boundaries with tribes. And so then they're asking her then to cross her own ethical boundaries as far as how she see things and way things she thinks should be done, right? I mean, she's hearing our methods and the things we're philosophizing all the time about at SKC and she's going, no, oh, no, no, I don't want to do those things that you're asking me to do um, because they're so odd in comparison to the things that we're teaching our students, right? And so there's a lot, it's, it's often it's really hard to find the middle ground, right? And so. Mm -hmm. and input in this process. Yeah, so <clears throat> in some ways, like, uh, so like the National Historic Preservation Act, as, as context, could be totally rewritten with the help of tribes. Something like NAGPRA was written with the help of tribes. Um, there were actually people that sat in the, in the policy meetings and helped to write the policy. Um, so. That, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about like when I did this, this thesis was where, where do we find the middle ground? Where do we fit? Where do tribal peoples fit in all this when policy is actually being written? And, and that not actually being taken advantage of either, 
right? Because what will end up happening is a lot of these, like a good example, maybe Army Corps of Engineers will, will take old CRM managers and then employ them and use them as sort of a weapon against tribes because they know how tribes operate. And so, um, so you might have one individual shows, a tribal person shows up to a consultation and there's no other tribal peoples in there. They're all managers for other entities and they're just, you just like, you're, you're speaking to the choir because they really aren't gonna listen to you. They placate to you a lot of times. They will, they will, um, they will say, okay, there's an alternative for, uh, let's say like a pipeline. And they go, okay, this alternative for this. And the, the tribal person will go, well, we're not okay with that. And they'll sit there and listen and they'll just move on to the next one. And so for them, all they did was their consultation, which they required to do, and they're going to keep on moving with their project. And what does that turn into? Lawsuits. A lot of really harsh feelings. Um, tribes and mistrust with other entities. And then tribes then began to sort of internalize and not even want to work with these people anymore. And vice versa, right? And, it, and tribal peoples actually do this as well, is um, they go into meetings very defensive, right? And that and you can just feel the tension when you walk in a, into a consultation process. And so nothing really ever is accomplished when those kinds of things happen. Yeah? But do you think it's part of what you had spoken of earlier, that consultation was written from that Western scientific, you know, mm -hmm. those objectives, not including tribal perspectives or ways about approaching that? Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about even an indigenous method, method for a consultation would be that there are distinct sovereign nations that have different methods of Mm -hmm. And those should be individually considered. When, yeah. Like, you know, instead of a one one flat approach for everybody. Yeah. Well, I, I mm. want to say something on. Yeah, go. On yeah. <laughs> there actually isn't one flat approach. So that's the problem with the consultation laws. It doesn't say how to do it. Mm -hmm. It just says to do it. But it's not enforceable. That's one. No, it, in that, as we get better in this job, it is actually enforceable. We have to do what tribes are now learning, and I teach it in my class where you have to do what's called the negotiation, uh, the rules. You have to sign a contract called the Rules of Negotiation. All lawyers do this for every kind of contractual law. Consultation never teaches this, right? So these are just basically the rules that you're going to go by furthering the negotiation, because that's all consultation is. But the hard part is, is that consultation doesn't require even to fix the problem. It just says to consider it. Mm -hmm. So, is it, and that's really up in the air, and people can define that as whatever. So, when these do get filed lawsuits against these entities, they can just say, "Well, we did. We considered it." And how are you can argue with that? You can't. You know? mm -hmm. So, you just try to get them locked up in the red tape. Is usually what ends up happening. So, yeah. The two biggest laws, NEPA and and uh, NHPA are two laws that were not written for tribes and by tribes and was never really even part of it. So mm -hmm. it was always for historic properties like buildings, things like that. So we just kind of use them. You know, we've learned to kind of deal with them in ARPA, like the Archaeological Resource Protection Act is, is one that has teeth and you can find, you can find uh, firms and federal agencies for the destruction of sites, but who's going to enforce that? That's the mm -hmm. biggest thing right now. Like, um, you can find them. You can say, this is what you've done. We do a damage assessment report on the site. This is how much you owe. Then what? Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no one to enforce it. Yeah. <clears throat> we're actually we're at a kind of a crossroads right now where we've talked about in our department where our jobs could completely go away by deregulation. And so we've been collaborating with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation in DC, and we've had them come out to Pablo, to the college, and they're in the same, they have that same mindset, that they're trying to stay under the radar right now because the laws and practices that we're actually working under by executive order could just go away, right? And then what would happen? We'd, Aaron would be out of a job, <laughs> you know? A lot of people would be out of a job, you know? Okay, things could really change. I've, yeah. I've heard the same thing at the park too, is that um, we're, th we're trying to just play under the radar right now because mm -hmm. a lot of things, if you push the right, if you push the envelope, uh, they're in a, they just want to cut programs right now. Yeah. Yeah. 
They might just, something just might just go away completely, right? That would be horrible for tribes. Even the trustee to the American Indian has taken this mentality, the BIA is now saying, don't say anything, don't squeak, let's just make it through this four years because if he finds out we even exist, I'm pretty certain the president doesn't even know the BIA exists, which is <laughs> I don't mean as an insult. I really do. I really do think he doesn't know it exists. So, um, <laughs> Joe killed. <laughs> um, so I think historic preservation is kind of acting under the same thing. Like, I'm not even sure how aware he is of the advisory council mm. of NHPA. So I think people are like, and it's sad that that's the case, that, mm. that, it, that it's even that way. And the, the head of the advisory council is actually appointed by the president, <laughs> so, which he actually took Obama's appointee and then replaced it. But I don't think he actually had anything to do with that. It was just somebody else that did it. Yeah. yeah. And so. Um, you have a question? Yeah. Sorry. So as a Fed, I live in complete fear that I will be <laughs> yeah. found out by my commander in chief. <laughs> but so far. Not yet. Mm -hmm. How do you think Indians feel? <laughs> 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this has been fascinating, Dean. Um, Thank you. And one thing that, uh, that's made me think, just you know, studying this slide, um, you know, I I came up and have been trained to think sort of left columnish mm -hmm. for the most part, and. The more I learn about native methodology, the more I find it compelling. Um, but I'd like your opinion on something. So uh, mm -hmm. I think yeah. both of you guys know that we have uh, three students from SKC that have started their graduate degrees in the wildlife program. Mm -hmm. And the wildlife program is working to embrace and integrate native methodology into what we have done traditionally. So, do you guys see this as oil and water, or do you see grounds, do you see opportunity to synthesize between the two, to, to pull them together? I think there's plenty of opportunity to find middle ground. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just you need to find middle ground, you just have to understand you're both on the same ground. Mm -hmm. And I think there's always this idea when we talk about indigenous approaches to science and, and uh, European approaches, is we're always saying like, this is my approach, and this is my approach, we don't ever just stop and say, well, what are we studying, right? And how do we get the most out of that, whatever that is, right? Put approaches aside, it's just, it's, it's working together to find the same thing. I think if we start looking too much at approach, and like, I'm, I'm gonna employ this approach, whatever, whatever, then that automatically starts to ruin this. Then you have to understand that tribes are what we call ecocentric peoples, right? So. You're understanding wildlife. You're understanding it from 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 the wildlife working back, right, to yourself, as opposed to a Eurocentric way of thinking would be from yourself and working your way out. That alone, just that way of thinking, would change everything. Mm -hmm. And I've told people that, and they try to just do it. Start there, like start something simple, like basic. Mm -hmm. Well, so and this is so. Jin showed me a really cool way of thinking about this that, ha that that's opened my eyes. And to an extent, I hear you saying the same thing, but and, and don't, don't take this too badly, but I heard a lot of emphasis on native methodology and then the scientific method or Western me methodology was kind of like, eh. And I would really like to hear more and more. And I think this is the start of a conversation, mm -hmm. to be honest. I really want to uh, find out more about what you guys think about it. But how do we work with our students to understand how this is all studying the same thing? So that, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're sending them away from UM with a master's of science in wildlife biology. At the mm -hmm. same time, we have rethought and thought more broadly about what wildlife biology is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's an honest question. Yeah. I don't know what, the, <clears throat> I don't even begin to know what the answer is. Uh, I mean, like, uh, so one of the things in Anthro is that everything's supposed to be applied, right? You're supposed to take these ideas and apply them out in the real world. Um, if we're thinking about in the, that in the context of preservation, 
Well, the idea of how you preserve something might be different because people are going to look at it different ways. Mm -hmm. The approach is going to be either, like Aaron said, from the outside in, inside out, whatever my feelings might be. Um, I think it may be, because, I mean, we learned this. We, Aaron and I both, we, we were embedded in this. I mean, you know, um, but we were also embedded in this. And like, uh, for me, I can, uh, I li like, I live in that, like, kind of in both worlds there, you know? And I do see value in both places. So for archaeology, there's times where I go, well, if we're going to protect something, man. We're, we're just going to have to do it in a way that's acceptable in the Western world to keep moving forward. We can't always just put our foot down and go, nope, that's it. Because then something might just be destroyed and then we're just out of something, right? So the best way, to, I think, to go about it is to like, find the common ground somewhere, figure out what it is that we want to do, what kind of solution are we looking for, and then try to figure it out. And that takes people talking. They're not always willing to talk, you know, and so, and if they are, they're talking by each other, you know, and so. Um, on like a side note to all this, is a, I'm part of this thing called the Indigenous Research Center. Yeah, I'm just gonna and, tell oh, you to talk SF about that. just awarded us three and a half million dollars to come up with methodologies for all geosciences and wildlife sciences to, on how to do research in Indian country and how to apply that research and what the, what's that look like. So um, we're going to try to figure it out, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, because it comes down to like, I feel like the, the fundamental question comes down to understanding a resource and managing one, right? Those are two different things. And it seems like when most people want to do a project or it's typically based on the management of something, right? It's not really just on, and I could, in that like theoretical academics, we try to do more of the understanding of something. But what's going on in Indian country is you're always having to deal with both. Most native students are coming to school in the sciences for this, for management. That's why they want to go back to their tribes and learn how to manage things. But then they take this degree and they go back and it just doesn't work. It's like, um, because it's typically it's theoretical or it's, it's academic and it's not like a trade school, right? Like we, that's honestly like kind of the thinking is mm -hmm. the trade school mentality, learn the skill that not necessarily the theory and all that stuff. So we're trying to like tackle how to take all of that and how to apply it to native students and make it work. But also, on a whole other thing, the loss of culture is so prevalent that most native students don't even think native anymore. So mm -hmm. th that's, there's a whole other issue there <coughs> that um, your intentions are, are good, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're even dealing with students that are inherently native people. You mm -hmm. know, they're just, it, it's, it's sad to say, but that's a huge part of what's going on in Indian country. It's like the intention is 20 years too late for a lot of people. And so we're dealing with all of that. So we got to deal with land management, wildlife management, hydrology, cultural preservation, and, both, and then research, and just old school, just do good research. You know? mm -hmm. It's hard. Mm -hmm. I wish I could answer your question, but I'm just kind of like throwing stuff at it. Well, I, like I said, I, I hope <laughs> this is the start of a conversation. I didn't expect anybody to have, you know, mm -hmm. off the top of Come up to the center. I will. And then we, we are actually, we, so this collaboration with the Advisor Council, we're looking to put on a summit um, next spring um, at SKC. Um, so interested parties would be folks like yourself. As I think the Indigenous Research um, Center is going to be a big part of this. Uh, we, already came, we already drafted an MOU, um, sorry, MOA, and um, the research uh, uh, center is going to be a part of it. Our department is going to be part of it, SKC. And then we're inviting managers, both at, in academics and in the real world that are doing these types of things to come. And then we want to design panels where we could actually talk about these kinds of things. Or we could say, okay, what is, let's get some people together and let's come up with a working definition of management in an indigenous method, <laughs> right? And what is that going to look like? draft something you know and then uh, then can we can we put that into use somewhere right i mean the, i think that's the ultimate goal yeah. you know and so for us 
well, that's what we're trying to do at SKC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and so it's hard. I mean, mm, it, it's, we're putting our students, we're pitting our students against the world. In some ways, this, we're putting them against the West, and they're, they're going to have a tough time. About, but they're <laughs> hopefully when they get out there, they're going to be, they're going to be able to, they're going to have, they do have an understanding because we we teach them. We teach the Western way. We want them to know both. Then they can decide what they want to do with it. Mm-hmm. You know, really and so. Really, just taking the best of both worlds. Yeah. Just learn to take what works and mm-hmm. decide. Yeah. yeah, we want a total station. I mean, we, <laughs> we're, we're using cool. we're using GIS. I mean, that's a, I mean that's valuable for us. You know, there's tools out there that we can use. Um, but I do think mm-hmm. just something basic to go with, and just something is to understand that to be indigenous and apply indigenous research to any subject is the application of oral history to that project. Mm -hmm. So I think as long as you're open to that, the other stuff is gonna work out fine. Trust Mm -hmm. that oral history is a a source, personal communication Mm -hmm. is citation, and and that can work, it can work, you know? That's a start, that's like a starting point, just Mm -hmm. know that. I I think that's a pretty exciting prospect. Mm -hmm. We can integrate that into how we have traditionally done business uh, in our wildlife program. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for any of these things that might come up, count me in. Yeah, and, uh, you bet. I, I would like to come up and spend some more time with you guys. Yeah, You're, yeah, always welcome. Yeah, always come up. and We have a lot of things going on. The center is going to change a lot of things. Yeah, Aaron's going to be spending a lot of his time in the research center doing that stuff, and he's uh, he's going to be able to facilitate a lot of people probably coming up to campus and That's maybe coming coming into the classroom and you know having these conversations. Uh, will the center be at SKC? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for NSF to to support that, that's a pretty big deal too. And so I mean, things are changing, definitely. You know? I think they're more curious than they are supportive. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really do. I met with them. I got to do all the presentations. And I do think it's more like, well, let's just see what they come up with. Because mm-hmm. I don't, it's NSF. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if anyone's ever worked with NSF. They're not a very, like, easy group of guys, you know? <laughs> and I say guys because they're all middle-aged. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate the conversation. I really do. It's it's a lot of fun to have these. I wish we could do it more, but Jen's been really great because she's invited us to do this the second time. Wants to hear us talk. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) she's fulfilling her deliverables for her grant, you know. And (laughs) but yeah, my parking was up at three. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I have. Oh, yeah, you bet. Yeah, thank you, bet. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Thank that guy. <laughs>